Be Wealthy and Smart, episode 289. into a world of wealth and financial freedom without budgets, boredom, or bosses on Be Wealthy and Smart. And now, here's your host, Linda P. Jones. Welcome to Be Wealthy and Smart. I'm Linda P. Jones, America's Wealth Mentor, empowering women and men worldwide to financial freedom. Today, we're going to talk about how your money history is driving your money habits. And you're going to learn why what's happened to you in the past is important to your present self in terms of your money. And this really hit me hard because I've been traveling this summer, visiting friends, getting out of the desert heat, and just having more conversation with some of my girlfriends, also some acquaintances, talking about the book that I'm writing. A lot about money has been coming up and just looking at money, examining money, and how people think about money. And a few things really hit me that I wanted to share with you because I think it's something that everybody deals with and it's something that you've probably got some things, I know I do, from my history of growing up in my family that definitely impact me with money and impact how I think and act about money. So that's what we're going to focus on today. So while I've been traveling with friends... I have had some great conversations and just in passing, you know, I have had stories come out which really have stuck with me or I've noticed and yet my friends, it kind of just goes right over their head. They don't even show consciousness about some of these money stories. So for example, one had a money story that mentioned that her mother was so obsessed with money, I guess is the word, that she would sell her children the items that she put up for a garage sale. She wouldn't even give them to her children because she wanted the money for them. So my friend told me a story about how she had given her dad something. Her mom put it in the garage sale, made the daughter buy it back, pay her money for it, And then her brother ended up wanting it. So she gave it to her brother and she said, I paid for it twice and I still didn't get it. So that pain is still with her as a fully adult grown woman who is near retirement. And here she is talking about this pain that she still feels from how her mother treated money. So do you think that that's going to impact how she thinks about money? I certainly think it does. And it's funny because although she's very well off, she doesn't see herself as well off. And she sees herself as poor without any, quote, discretionary income, even though her house is full to the brim with things. She's got things in her closets, things downstairs, things in the garage, just jammed full of stuff. But yet she doesn't feel like she has enough money. So it's really interesting. I think a story like that can show you how you were given negativity toward money or how maybe it made you feel like money was more important to you than love from your parent. You know, maybe it felt like, hey, my mom didn't love me enough just to give me this item. She made me buy it from her. So therefore, money becomes this thing that you sort of have this negative aversion to and feel like it's a bad thing. It's something that keeps you from the love of your parent. I mean, maybe I'm playing armchair psychiatrist too much here, but I can definitely make that connection and see how that could possibly be so. Another friend of mine owns three homes, but yet carries no cash, and she's always telling me how broke she is. In her case, her father owned his own business, and it was a very up and down financial business. So he put the reins tight on money because there were those good years where he had to save money and prepare for the lean years. So money was always tight. It never seemed like he was giving money or letting the money flow. And so she always feels broke because that's kind of how her mom was always. It was always like, oh, we don't have money to spend. We don't, we can't do anything with money. 
And so it was always this tightness around money, and she's carrying on the same activities that her parents did. So these tight reins on money are making her feel like she's broke, can't really spend it, doesn't have it, certainly can't keep it in her wallet, even though there's plenty in her ATM machine, her wallet always shows that she's broke. So that mindset that there's never enough reflects in her wallet, reflects in her actions, in her words, and in her inner feelings that she never has enough. The truth is, They're very well to do and have multiple homes, but do have a lot of expenses. So the cash flow is tight, but the net worth is very high. What does she do, though? She compares herself to the richest man in the world, Bill Gates, and says she feels poor compared to him. Well, doesn't everybody feel poor compared to Bill Gates? I mean, for heaven's sakes, he's, you know, has so many billions, of course, everyone feels poor compared to what Bill Gates can afford. But that doesn't mean that you're poor. That doesn't mean that you're broke. That doesn't mean that you're not in the top 5%, 2%, 3% of the world's wealthiest. Remember, most people in the world only survive on $2 a day, $2 a day. So for anyone making a high income, certainly a six-figure income, and having a multiple seven-figure net worth, you are in the very, very successful category in the world. So you have to allow yourself that that's okay to feel that way and not choose to feel broke or to feel like you don't have enough or that you're poor because you're not as rich as Bill Gates. I mean, that's just crazy. You're wealthier than, and many Americans are wealthier than 98% of the world. So we have to allow ourselves the feeling that it's okay that we are well off. It's okay to feel grateful for that and to focus on all that we have rather than feeling like we don't have a 25,000 square foot mansion. It doesn't matter. That's not the measure of wealth. And it's not that you have to be a multi-billionaire to be wealthy. Literally, most of the world is living on so much less that we have to really focus on feeling grateful and seeing all that we have, all the blessings that we have. And that is going to help us have that breakthrough to feel like we have prosperity. Another friend of mine, I was talking on the phone with someone about my book that I've been working on, and we were talking about investing in stocks. And she said that her father was so obsessed with stocks that every conversation with her father had to find its way back to talking about stock or he just wasn't interested. So it really made her and her sister sort of feel like they were slighted because he loved stocks more than he loved them. I mean, that's sort of the underlying non-spoken message there. So what she was saying to me was, gee, I can't really get interested in investing because to me, it's sort of an evil thing or it's a thing that competed with my attention from my father. So I can't really get interested in investing. It's something I want to stay away from. I think it's going to be, you know, overtake my life or it's going to make me not pay attention to people or give people love because I'm going to become so obsessed with it or just resenting it because it was that thing that her father gave all his attention and seeming love to. In his mind, maybe he was trying to be the provider and that was the way he could be a good father. But in her mind, it was stocks that he cared about and not his children. And that came across as a very bad thing. And so there's this negative association with investing in stocks. So these are the things that I want you to be aware of and find those stories in your past. Maybe you have something that your family thought or your family talked about or did or there was some past history in your life that you can look at because I really think that there's something going on here where we're choosing to feel poor, we're choosing to feel like we don't have enough, we're choosing to feel like we're not well off when we are very well off and We can't see those underlying money blocks that are there because of things our parents said or did or ways they treated us. So for your assignment, I want you to go back into your memory and think about your parents. 
What did your parents say about money? Or how did your parents act with money? Can you come up with an example of something that your parents said or did with money? Then your next assignment is pretend you won the lottery. And of course, your first response is probably going to be exciting and jumping up and down and screaming. Okay, fine, get through all of that. What's your next emotion after that? When the reality really sets in that you won the lottery, what's your next emotion? Is it something like, oh no, I don't know what to do now? Or how do I not lose this money? I always lose money. How do I not lose it? Or gosh, this feels like a burden. I really don't know what to do with this. Oh my gosh, I have so many decisions to make. What if I make the wrong decision? What are the negative things that are coming up in your mind when you really sit down and go through the imaginary winnings of the lottery and imagination that you won the lottery? Where does your brain go after that when reality sets in? So those are the things I want you to do. Go back in your past history with money, Because your past history and how your parents taught you about money is certainly affecting your present money. And what does it feel like after you've won the lottery? Those are your two assignments. Spend some time with this and find out where your money pain is. Because I bet you can draw a direct line between what happened in your household and what's happening with you now. And if you had positivity around money in your household, great. Maybe you've got some fabulous positive things that are happening. But there's also, there's always that story of something that went wrong with money that's super important for you to know about. So spend some time with this. You'll learn a lot. Write about it in your wealth journal and do some meditation around this and see if you don't get some enlightenment about money in your life. If you haven't yet subscribed to Be Wealthy and Smart, please hit the subscribe button and leave me a review on iTunes or Stitcher Radio. And if we haven't connected yet on social media, I'm at Linda P. Jones on Instagram and Twitter where I leave extra tips and ideas. I talk about my travels and my personal life and also on Facebook at Linda P. Jones fan page. If you'd like to get your net worth moving in the right direction, go to lindapjones.com and get my 11 quick financial tips to boost your wealth. There are 11 quick things you can do to get your net worth moving quickly. That's all for today. Until next time, live the good life and be wealthy and smart. Thank you for listening to Be Wealthy and Smart with Linda P. Jones. Share the wealth and tell your family and friends about the show. Check out our website, blog, and social media for more riches at www.bewealthyandsmart.com.